All right, welcome to Kirk Spano's Fundamental Trends. Uh, Friday, May 11th, the day before the last poker tournament at the Ho-Chunk Bingo Casino in the Wisconsin Dells that I'll be playing in tomorrow. And today we're going to talk about trading the oil rally because we've been very on that the last uh, year. So let's uh, try to make a little bit of money. Feel free to... Uh, Put your questions in, and we're going to go through a lot of stuff. If you were here earlier in the preview, uh, I usually play a video before these um, teleconferences, webinars, and uh, had somebody talking about trading in the refiners and Marathon Petroleum. Uh, we went over that a little bit, and we'll get back to it at the end because the refiners are probably not where you want to be anymore. You should be selling them at this point because they're going to start reporting – uh, tighter margins in the next quarter or two and you do not want to be a piece of that when that happens because they will get their butts kicked so trading the oil rally is it a rally or is it the new secular bull market that i've talked about well you know how i feel so i've been talking a lot about oil going all the way back to 2011 june of 2014 i called the oil crash see that chart pretty good. OPEC brings opportunity, not doom, but I tell people to wait a little bit. I should have followed my own advice. I started buying uh, in here a little lower. It got a little made a bit of long money, and then I got the second part of that crash. Had a very bad second half of the year in 2015. I talk about the beginning of the end for the oil age. I get literally threatening email. Why? <laughs> because apparently there's a lot of money in oil and from investors to business people, and they didn't like to hear it. In fact, I'll tell you a little story. When I wrote this article in the middle of 2015, the beginning of the end for the oil age, I didn't say it was imminent. I said it would take a decade or two. And I got somebody call my office, pretending to be a potential client, and then he just ripped into me. Turns out it was a broker from New York who was very heavy in the oil trade right here telling me how oil was going to come roaring back how it wasn't going to take long and how all those oil stocks are bargains boom, 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 boom. and then he got his ass kicked he didn't call back in any case uh, near the bottom of the oil i talked about how the energy sector had changed forever and that saudi arabia is likely to start start boosting the price of oil within a month that's what they did and ever since, the price of oil has been drifting upwards. So I talk about here, four stocks for the oil bull market. The Trump oil trade, how it might soon reach 100 again. Coming peak oil plateau and higher oil prices. The last secular oil bull market has begun all along the way. I mocked, 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 and called stupid, call a warmonger when I talked about the tensions with Iran. And then just a couple of months ago, I said this is the new golden age for oil stocks. It's about to begin. Are you in it? You should be, because you can double or triple your money here in the next couple of years. If you want to take a look at the articles I've written, uh, this is most of them. Uh, these are all the ones on Seeking Alpha anyway. Uh, there are links back to some of the Market Watch articles, but if you put my name in, Kirk Spano, and then Market Watch after it, uh, you'll get two links. One will just be recent articles, uh, under their investing section, but then you'll find their old trading deck where I was. And there's probably 20 or 30 articles in there. Back in 2012, I was telling people to load up on oil stocks. And uh, all those all those stocks doubled and tripled. That's what we have coming right now. Why is that about to happen? Well, I hear there's something going on in the Middle East. Nope, I do not want that straight to my inbox. Nice hair, though. Iran crossed the red line after Israel pounds Iranian targets. Have you been watching what's going on? Um, I was on Twitter earlier yesterday just ridiculing CNN for the 24-hour, 24-7, every damn day of the week coverage of uh, the Russia-Trump investigation. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going, I mean, they're covering uh, Kellyanne Conway's 
husband tweeting. I mean, it's just insane. You know what? We've got a problem, right? The Russians tried to interfere with our election. They probably did it just because they were being jerks. Do they have some tie-in with President Trump? I don't know. Let Robert Mueller do his job. But I don't need to hear everybody's freaking opinion of it every goddamn day on CNN. So this is what I have to say to CNN. I'm going to be over at The Independent and BBC and other places because their coverage of the world is much, much, much better. So Israel and Iran on the brink of war. I've talked about this, haven't I? I think I talked about this, right? Let's see here. Iran war is coming. Oh, my mouse is just, I think I need a new mouse. I changed the batteries and the mouse is jumpy. All right, come on, come on. I need a touch screen. There you go. The Iran war is coming, buy oil stocks now. September of last year, I talked about this. The Iran here, war is here, folks. Israel and Iran are at war. That's, that's what's happening. And hopefully there's a revolution in Iran. Uh, that would be great for uh, the people there because they need to get rid of the ruling uh, um, party. And they need to have somebody, uh, probably Israel, probably the United States, uh, put enough pressure on the IRGC so they do not take their guns and point them at the Iranian people like they have done in the past. So if you go and read the comments on this article, I'm a warmonger, I'm a neocon, I'm a communist, um, I'm a lot of things, uh, according to them. If you listen to last week's article, you or last week's webinar, you got my response. About two or three minutes in, I tell them what they can go do to themselves, the people who want to call me that. Um, like I said, I'd prefer a very peaceful solution uh, and a very um, quick transition to electric vehicles, but neither is going to happen. Price of oil is going up, and it's going to go probably to 100 maybe $120 a barrel. It is not going to go to 300 or 250 or 500 as some of the newsletter uh, headline writers are, are, are touting. But as you know, we are in oil directly right now. Why? Because there's backwardation. You should know what backwardation means. Uh, that is when the price of oil is more favorable to sell today than holding on to it. Very simple way of understanding that. Contango is when the future price of oil makes it uh, worthwhile to hold on to your oil because you get a higher price in the future. The problem with futures contracts is that as those contracts roll off every month, if the future price of oil is higher, then you have to pay more for your futures contra or contract, right? So what you want is the price of oil to be higher today and then you will be able to get the benefit of rolling the contract because you're renewing and rolling at a lower price. The ETFs, ETNs, mainly ETFs at this point, uh, that engage in trading uh, futures for oil, uh, you want backwardation, otherwise you're going to have your uh, oil ETF go down in value even if the price of oil goes up sometimes. So you need backwardation for these uh, ETFs to work. So all those people who owned the UNG years ago saying, oh, the price of gas is going up, which is going to happen eventually, um, probably not for another year or two, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll get a little pop over the summer, is that, uh, you know, they were all buying in the UNG, and even though uh, price of gas went from two bucks uh, per million British thermal units to, to four, they didn't make any money. Why? Because the contracts weren't priced in a way that allowed for that. Because these ETFs um, are basically trading futures contracts for you. And if it's not in backwardation, if we're not seeing a backward market, uh, you're just going to lose money. So going back in here, late last year, oil contracts started to go from contango to backwardation. And it happened somewhere right in here. 
is where backwardation first occurred. I, I know I mentioned it a couple of times, but I wasn't sure if the relationship would hold. Uh, it's for sure holding now, and now you're seeing a breakout in oil prices. How high can oil prices go? I've said that uh, you know 80 to 100 seems to be right. So as we trade our um, oil contract, our oil ETFs here, and these are the two that we, we don't own USO. We own US for people who aren't using options. Uh, we, are, we own USOU. So if the price of oil does in fact go to 80 on WTI and it's about 71 right now, <clears throat> that implies about a 12 or 15% jump in the price of oil. So that means that this uh, USOU should go, you know, about 40 to 45% higher, right? So you just multiply by three because it's a three times oil ETF. As long as we're in backwardation, that uh, relationship will hold. If we went into contango suddenly, it wouldn't work, right? So it's not only the price of oil that we have to look at, it is um, how the contracts are structured. Backwardation, 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 you gotta have it. So make sure you understand that. You're looking at a website that can tell you that. Uh, my articles will tell you that. Um, the article I'll put out today, which is gonna have all these charts in it, uh, will tell you that. So I'm gonna do an article today for members. I'll submit it to Seeking Alpha for the free side, probably be out tomorrow. I have a link to this uh, video as well. So how high can USOU go? Um, you know, so you think about a 40% jump, 40% uh, of 70 is in our 20s, so around 100-ish. I think USOU can go to around 100-ish. Um, so I am starting to sell it in the 80s, starting to scale out in the 80s because that will represent a good 20 to 30% gain for us um, because we bought around 60. And uh, I wish we had bought, uh, you know, down, down around 45 because I think 45 would have been uh, – our signals were pretty good back here. But I'm 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 tentative on this stuff. I don't want to get people involved in a trade that's gonna gonna hurt them, right? You know, because what if we had invested here, you know, at, at 55, 56, 57 the first time, it drops down to 44. People are very angry. So I wanted to see the trend really break out. So once it got past this area again, that's what I knew, right? Because it, it didn't go through resistance here, but here it did. It finally goes through resistance. So we've gotten 10, uh, we're almost up 15% here, right? Most of you guys uh, who bought on that first day are up probably 15%. That's a nice one and a half week gain, right? I can take 15% every week and a half. Man, I, I wouldn't work the other two and a half weeks a month. That would be awesome. Um, so I'm thinking this goes up to 100-ish. Yeah, if you wanna buy it, you know, look for one of those dips during the day, you know, Set a limit order. This is why I advocate sitting limit orders. Just don't sit in front of your computer. Uh, somebody just typed in, yeah, these up 17%. Um, so you get one of these dips and that's where you buy it, right? So just set your buy price at maybe, what does that say? Yeah, you're not gonna get it all the way down at 61, but 67? Yeah, I think you said just set a buy price at 67 to buy more. Because the, because the overriding dynamics not going to change overnight. We're not suddenly going to say, "Oh, Iran, just kidding." We're not. Iran and Israel aren't going to just say, "Ah, oh, let's be friends." You know, we're not going to see shale increase uh, production by a half a million barrels. Uh, you know, they they're on the schedule. They're on for the rest of this year. Their capex is already pretty much set. Capex is pretty much set for next year too. <coughs> Excuse me, I do not have a cough button. And the weather is changing here in Wisconsin. Anybody wants to give me a place to live in Costa Rica, let me know because uh, the weather here has been pretty insane. Um, so USOU, about 100-ish I think it's going to go to. You know, if, if there actually is bombs dropped in Iran, you know, then we might get one of those spikes. Uh, but I wouldn't count on it. And for a spike, I'd prefer to use options on DBO DBO, same thing, breaking out. Um, this is not leveraged, uh, but if you use options on it, you know, if you buy calls, uh, and we own calls on this as well, um, those calls are up 
a little bit more than 15%, 20-25%. Somebody says they're up on USO 43%. So PRR1111, you bought, you bought USO the very first time I mentioned it months ago. Good for you. It wasn't an official recommendation back then. Oh, you're a superstar. Can I, can you, can you, can you manage my money, please? Um, all right. So this one, not, not, uh, not leveraged. Uh, so it's going to go into the thirteens probably for sure. Uh, but that will, uh, based on what we got our options in for that should end up being at least a double for us. And I think probably a triple, right? And if it keeps going higher, you know, more. So you get leverage on your money when you have options because once you get past your strike price, price plus, plus your premium, now you're making multiples on your money. So this is what you want. You want options on DBO if you think that you might, you know, you want something to give you uh, a way to take part in a spike in oil, right? Because if oil goes to 200 a barrel, which is very unlikely in the first place, but if it does, it'll be super temporary because the United States will release a ton of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, there will be more fracking. And Saudi Arabia, within 90 days, they can throw a million barrels out there. So, you know, I talked about that Goldilocks price of oil. The Goldilocks price of oil is going to be between 80 and 100 because that's where... Uh, our companies make money hand over fist, which we're about to get to. Um, and Saudi Arabia can price the Saudi Aramco uh, IPO where they want it because they can say, look, we're the swing producer. And here's the, tr and here's the secret. All these people who have been talking about the United States as swing producer have been wrong, wrong, wrong. Saudi Arabia is the swing producer in oil. Say it after me. Repeat it. Read my lips. I know you can see them. Read my lips. Saudi Arabia is the swing producer in oil. They're the ones that can turn on 2 million barrels a day within months. We can't do that. Are we going to see increasing production in the United States for the next couple of years? Yes. Will we probably top out around 12 million barrels a day and hold that for a year or two or three? Yes. But then at that point, and I've talked about this, the high grading in the oil fields, right, getting the cheapest, easiest to get oil first goes away. You can't, you can't keep getting the cheapest, easy to get oil. The, the improvements in technology are barely holding the line on, on production costs right now. And because sand is getting more expensive and help is getting more scarce, there's just no lowering. They're not lowering the price of getting oil anymore. That ended about a year ago. So you see the Bakken, which has been flat on their production. Um, Niobra, you go all the all these shale plays, they're not really seeing increasing production except where the Permian Basin is really killing it. Uh, and that's a big, big area. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's what, a third of West Texas and part of New Mexico is a lot of area. So that's a big, huge oil field, series of oil fields down there. And, and that's where the majority of the um, cheapest oil is coming from. You have a little in the stack scoop, you know, a little in the Eagle Ford, but that's mainly condensate. So, you know, you have to know your, your oil fields and, and where and where your plays are. I don't want not, I don't want anything to do with the Niobra. And I know that there's some players right now that are doing very well. Uh, I believe Whiting Petroleum is there and they're not hedged very much. So they'll probably make a lot of money in the short term. But when the price of oil finally starts drifting back down to 70 in a couple of years, uh, you know, because we'll have a recession eventually, um, some of those unhedged companies are going to get beat up. So you need to watch the hedging and that's just starting right now. Companies are starting to hedge their 2019 and 2020 production, and they're and they're going to get prices in the 70s versus, um, uh, you know, in the 50s. So you see all these corporate reports coming out and how all these companies are pushing out more and more free cash flow, right? You've told you've heard me say these companies are going to become free cash flow machines. Well, that's what's starting to happen. But they did it at $51, $52, dollars oil. How much cash flow are they going to have at $70, $71, $72 oil? What if they hedge their oil for 2020, 2021, and 22, which is probably the range where the next recession is? I'm, I'm saying 2020 on the next recession. But let's suppose that they have their oil hedged at $80 a barrel when it plunges to 60 again. They don't care. They're still making money. 
So that could be bad for the next recession. You know that I think that there's a chance um, we could have stagflation in the next recession where, where prices don't really come down because energy costs don't come down yet. Uh, and that's a big fixed cost for most people. Healthcare won't be coming down yet because uh, we still need Congress and the government to put the screws to healthcare. Um, you know my feeling on that. I think the whole country should be on Medicare and we should all go out and buy a supplement. I know most people don't understand uh, Medicare. Medicare is not administered by the federal government. It is administered by private health insurance companies region to region throughout the United States on a, on a bid contract. For example, in Wisconsin, uh, Medicare is administered by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Hey, private company gets a contract, just like anybody else who deals with the, co with the, co with the, co with the uh, government. And then they run out and sell everybody a supplement, which is just as profitable as a regular health care plan. So now you get negotiation on drug prices, which was just in the news yesterday. I digress. So in any case, the next recession is coming. When it does, they're going to have their oil prices hedged pretty high. And they're going to make a lot of money. So USO, DBO, USOU, um, the USOs are great for the short term. DBO, you want to own options on, some calls on if you want to you know, have some uh, exposure to a spike. Oil companies, XOP. I've been telling people to buy XOP now for since in here, right? And that was in the 30s. And now we finally broke into the 40s. How high can it go? Well, let's take a look at the holdings. These are the holdings for XOP. Accidental. We love. And Deaver just got bought, so that'll be Marathon Petroleum soon. Devon Energy. You know, you, you're going to get a little bit of refiner here, but this uh, is primarily uh, exploration and production. Pioneer. I would bet that this shoots up the list. All right, so these companies, how many of them can double and triple in the, <coughs> in the next few years? Okay, I don't know a lot about Carrizo. California resources were pretty beat down. Whiting Petroleum could. Uh, Oasis. Continental Resources, Accidental. Hess, Conoco, Devon, right? RSP Permian, which just bought Picacho. I think this one was pretty good. Parsley, uh, they're tied to uh, a pipeline. Uh, you know, Newfield, Pioneer. You know, a lot of these companies double or triple. Now, does that mean that uh, this ETF or double triple? No, because the refiners will be a bit of a drag on it, right? So when I publish the ETF to own, I talk about this one because for people who don't pick out stocks, this is probably the best they're going to do. Um, some of those folks will buy the leveraged ETF versions of this and uh, they won't understand why it doesn't uh, correlate to the way they think it should correlate because they don't understand how the pricing of options and futures work, which are what underlie these contracts um, when you have leverage. So XOP, if you really want to get leverage on it, buy calls. That's what we own. We've been buying calls since last December. Uh, my calls are up 60 to 80%. Who owns calls on uh, XOP? I mean, we, we got to be closing on a double pretty soon here. So XOP is a great place to just jump in. And here's the place where you might really get catch a breakout that's just starting is XES, the equipment and services. Why? Because they're going to be able to price, increase their prices. Uh, all these companies that had to lower their prices, and a lot of these companies went bankrupt and came out. And a lot of companies just don't exist anymore. But all these service companies, and you know, and I hate the Transocean is in here uh, because Deepwater's just not going to go anywhere. Uh, they're too long cycle. You know, just a little, just a little thoughts on deep water. I've been right about this. I called the bankruptcy and sea drill. Um, I, 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 you know, go on tip ranks. You'll see that I was shorting Transocean a couple years ago. Um, deep water is not coming back because it's too long cycle. When you have to put billions of dollars into some of these projects, and you aren't going to be able to produce enough oil in them. Uh, to pay yourself back for 10 years, but you're afraid the electric vehicles maybe don't take 10 years to get here. What if the electric vehicles get here in five, six, seven?
then your then your long mega project cycle, your long cycle mega projects don't pay you back. So are you gonna get lots of little projects in the ocean? Yes. Are they gonna be shallower shelf? Yes. Are they gonna be super deep and long cycle? No. Well, and that's a problem for a company like Transocean, which is focused on the higher complexity, uh, more expensive, deeper water projects. Uh, ultimately, I think Transocean goes bankrupt. I think there's massive consolidation in the space. I think they probably consolidate with another company or two yet, and then they go bankrupt. And the, sh and the bondholders become the shareholders, and they end up becoming a maintenance company, and <clears throat> eventually there's gonna be like three companies left in this space. So, you know, if you wanna get into deep water as a very long-term player, uh, use the bonds. You wanna get first priority bonds and, you know, look for discounts uh, to uh, par value uh, because he ain't gonna get par value. So, you know, keep that in mind. But in any case, a lot of these are going to do very, very well. Um, I think Baker Hughes is going to end up making GE a lot of money and that will um, help GE, uh, US Silica, Sand, um, Halliburton, which is finally getting over the Baker Hughes uh, breakup, you know, when they tried to do that deal. So you go through here, National Oil, well, Avarco is a good company. Um, Helmer Campaign has been a company that we've owned. Uh, and I think if you own it, you, you hold on uh, because several of these names are gonna double and Helmer Campaign is the one that probably is most likely to double. You see it's been on this plateau here for a while. It's a little higher than when we bought it, right? We bought it in here, but it's been plateauing here. It's kind of bouncing around. It's gonna break off. Right now, actually probably if you want Helmer campaign, you wanna buy it right about now because it's gonna bounce off of here and it's gonna go up. And how high is it gonna go up? Well, I don't know. I don't think it's going to 110, but it might. You know, I mean, I'd say that 110 ish is, is the high side, uh, but I think that 90 is probably, probably really what, you know, it might break out from here. 90 to 100, yeah, 90 to 110 is probably making a lot of sense. Uh, I do know that their earnings are, are going to start going up pretty dramatically here. So if you want, if you want a pure play, I'd say Helmer campaign, they're the biggest uh, land driller in America. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the Gulf of Mexico plays are interesting too. There you go. So, you know, CJ Energy Services, man, I owned them a long time ago. Made a lot of money. All right. Some of our stocks in Kana. It's been breaking out, right? I was telling folks, buy it way back in here, back in the eight and nine days. And now it's up 13. And it's been breaking out. How high can it kind of go? Let me tell you. So they have those four, four key assets, uh, the uh, Permian assets, the Eagle Ford assets, um, Duvarnay, and uh, Novotny. And I may have said the Canadian ones wrong. Um, their Permian assets are so valuable that I believe that represents the current share price of the company. The Eagle Ford assets and the Canadian assets aren't getting assigned any value at all right now. Think about that. You're getting free oil plays with Encana. Um, Royal Dutch Shell just said that they want to find asset plays in the, in the Permian, Eagle Ford, then those two uh, Canadian plays, Duvernay, Vatney. And again, I, I need to really write those on a chalkboard in my office on my whiteboard so I can just look at those words and, and learn how to spell them correct, uh, say them correctly. Um, Royal Dutch Shell is specifically looking for the assets that Encana has. I don't know if Royal Dutch Shell buys Encana, but it wouldn't surprise me um, I think that Encana is the most buyable company out there. And I think that um, they could either sell part of the company or all the company. I think their Eagle Ford assets, I think those get sold no matter what. Uh, so when they sell the Eagle Ford assets, you're going to see a ton of cash drop to the bottom line. 
I think that in Connor goes to between 20 and 30. I, I don't think there's much doubt in my mind of that. Um, I think they'll end up setting new highs. Um, I think they're going to blow way past this. They're going to go way above 23, 24. So uh, I like this one a lot. So if you want growth in the space, here you go. That's, that's a good pattern. It could take off. Pioneer. Pioneer is converting to being a pure play in the Permian Basin, selling off all their other assets. They have a very good uh, environment to do that in. So, you know, how high do they go? Well, let's take a look. How high can they go? Uh, for sure, I think they're going to break out past their previous highs. Two thirties. I think that that's a done deal. How far past the two thirties can they go? Again, um, ever since uh, David Einhorn called them the mother fracker of the um, of the uh, shale world, uh, they've actually done very well for themselves to fix their company in the face of that oil crash. So now that we're coming out of all of that, uh, where are they going to go? Well, they've already doubled off their bottom, right? Uh, will they double again from here? I think it could happen. Why? Again, these companies are just going to print money the next few years. And again, if they hedge at an oil price around 80, even when the oil price drops back down to 60, they won't care, right? Because what they'll do is they will sell all the hedge oil they have and they will just not produce much more beyond that. And what will that do? That'll bring the price of oil back up to 80. So any drop in the price of oil uh, will be tradable because it ain't gonna last. These companies are too smart at this point. There's been so much consolidation. Um, Exxon and Chevron will be the ones that start to produce more uh, when the time comes because Exxon and Chevron are, are in desperate straits. I know that everybody wants to talk about them as best of breed. They aren't. I just showed you two of the best of breed and I'm about to show you the best one. Um, Exxon and Chevron are, are in big trouble <clears throat> because they have all of those deep water assets all over the world that are just never, ever going to get developed. They have so much in stranded assets uh, that they're, they're really going to have a problem. Uh, uh, with their balance sheets eventually. So they're not going to be able to support their dividends. Um, they're not going to be able to sell any of their assets. Who's going to buy from Chevron and Exxon? Chevron and Exxon are the buyers. So Chevron and Exxon have rough days coming. Will they go up with this oil rally? Yes. If you own Chevron and Exxon, look for a spot to swap in the better oil companies. Bottom line, Encana is a better one. Pioneer is a better one because Pioneer will be a, a Permian near pure play or pure play soon. And then here's the one that I've been talking about and talking about and talking about. We had that second time that we got a chance to buy it on cheap, right? Because I was telling, telling people to buy it back in here, got mocked and went way up, came back. People started to buy more of it. I sure did. And now look, it's breaking out. And that's a heck of a breakout. Why is it breaking out? Occidental until the RSP Permian Concho merger was the biggest producer in the uh, Permian. Maybe they still are. I haven't seen updated numbers. Uh, so they're your first or second in the Permian. And, um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, this stock, man, this is going to go way into the hundreds, way into the hundreds. And why do I say that? Not only is it because of the assets they, they, they own, Right, they're, they're gonna go, all these stocks are gonna break out. They're just gonna keep breaking out. Man, I do have to buy a new mouse. I finally broke my mouse. I'm gonna spend $20 more. Let's see, 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah accidentals for sure going over 100. Um, you know, again, these are not official guarantees. I'm not allowed to do that, keep that in mind. Uh, but this is my level of confidence. I believe um, that Occidental is going into the hundreds. I have no intention of selling it until it gets into the hundreds and breaks out. Um, they have the uh, VLCCs, the very large uh, uh, cargo ships that are going to be uh, taking more and more oil out of Corpus Christi next year. Late this year, that might happen, but for sure next year. Uh, so Occidental is the biggest exporter of oil. 
from the United States ports. So they're going to make money hand over fist exporting light, sweet, crude, because we can't refine it all ourselves. We have to ship it to people who have refineries set up for light, sweet, crude. Remember, our refineries are set up for heavy sour because we have been importing from uh, the Middle East and from Canada. And ultimately, uh, we're going to get more oil from Canada, and then we're going to export more of our light, sweet, crude. So just kind of think about it. Canadian oil used in the United States, United States oil used everywhere else. Uh, we're going to export a lot of oil. And that's just going to keep on happening uh, because the deep water projects are just going to keep on getting thinner and thinner. And we're going to fill that space through the early 2020s, maybe middle 2020s, with around 12 million barrels a day of production. Uh, that's about where it's going to level off, right in, right around there. And uh, when, you, when you see these companies, Accidental, which is not only making money in, in the Permian, uh, and then they have some other assets, um, including Middle East um, and uh, Oman, I believe, yeah, and Oman. Um, you know, then they then they also get to export it, and they make that money because they they get the price, but then they also charge fees for using their port. So you want a company that's really really well positioned, Accidental. And by the way, if you're in, if your mom is in Exxon or Chevron for the dividend, <clears throat> sell it and buy this. Sell Exxon and Chevron and buy this. This has a three and a half percent dividend right now. It was over four, it was close to five when I was pounding the table. Um, but these guys are way better positioned to pay their dividend and offer growth than Exxon or Chevron. So this is my Exxon and Chevron replacement stock. Uh, you know, come back to me in three years and uh, say, hey, that really worked out because it will. All right, any questions? I already talked about refiners um, and Devers being bought by Marathon Petroleum. Um, you know, we're gonna have to see a big conversion of how these companies do business as the EVs come online over the next 10 years. So they're gonna have infrastructure costs because Marathon Petroleum, obviously, and Phillips 66 have the gas stations all over the place. I've talked about that's actually a place I'd like to invest, buy one of those uh, abandoned gas stations on a highway or truck stops on a highway and uh, do some creative things with uh, solar energy, electric chargers, restaurants, you know, historical sites, whatever. You know, there, there's probably several dozen around the country that I'm, I'm going to look at uh, in the next couple of years. And... Um, refiners are going to have lower and lower margins as the price of oil goes higher. So I'm selling the the refiners into the strength right now. And Deaver, I'm close to selling off my last holdings, uh, but I did take it off our very short list. Um, took Phillips 66 off of our very short list a couple of months ago. Uh, again, just so you understand, if you're in refiners, as the price of oil goes up, their margins get thinner even though they're, and, the, and their volumes won't go up much, right? So demand's going up a little bit, you know, one or 2% per year, but if the margins come down 10 or 15%, that's a big deal, right? So you wanna sell your refiners into the strength, switch over to Occidental, Pioneer, Encana, XOP, XES, Helmerk and Payne is the one that I, I, I like. Um, Baker Hughes is going to get sold. G is going to sell their stake to somebody, probably a private equity firm. Um, if you have uh, deep water drillers, sell them into the strength because you may never get another chance. Um, so there you go. Let's fire out the questions and get out of here in under an hour today. All right. Yes, buy USOU on dips. Yes, I answered your question about mom and the CVX and the XOM. I'm sitting at 11% energy in my portfolio with ECA, XOP, and KMI. I'm looking to move to 20% energy. I'm also holding a $15 call on USO, Occidental, and Pioneer. That's what I would own. That's what I would add. Yep, I like Occidental and Pioneer. Uh, somebody's ask, asking about natural gas with Antero. Antero is a favorite of mine for long-term play in natural gas. Um, 
we need a hot summer for natural gas prices to pick up, right? Uh, and Terrell, the reason I'm in them through this natural gas slump is because they're the best hedged and they're still cash flow positive. So, and, and they're a buyout play. So I just keep rolling calls on them and selling puts on them um, to maintain exposure because I don't know when natural gas is finally going to pop. There's going to be more associated natural gas with oil drilling. Uh, but if demand, we need we need to see the demand side of natural gas continue to pick up with the exports that is happening. I can't tell you which quarter it's going to be. I can just tell you that at some point natural gas is going to rally, um, and and you'd think it would be soon. Uh, but it's it, it, there's a lot of a lot in storage yet, um, not as high as it was. Uh, we need a hot summer. And, and you'll see natural prices go, natural gas prices go up uh, because then that'll take down some of the inventory going into winter. Um, we'll see. I, I, I don't think Antero should be a gigantic position, uh, but I like selling puts and then using that premium to buy calls. All the energy stocks seem to have run up too much to buy today. You're wrong. Um, I just explained Antero. I think that you buy all these oils. The, the oil stocks are starting to break out. You got to understand what a breakout is. A breakout is going higher. So all these oil stocks are starting to break out. Um, you'll get a down day here and there, right? Use those down days to, to buy the positions um, and sell puts. If you know how to sell puts, sell puts. I love selling puts. Um, I will tell you, my very aggressive accounts are almost half an energy right now. The first thing I'm going to sell is USOU. Second thing I'm going to do is sell all my short, shorter dated calls, right? That'll get me back down to 25%. Um, so right now I'm riding this for the easiest money. Um, and then I'll bring it back down to a quarter. And then, you know, the day will come where I get back down to 10, 11, 12% in energy, but I don't see that happening for a couple of years. I have a lot of XOM and CVX. You know, here's the thing. It's hard to pick out a price on those. So XOM, right? It just went up. I'd sell it now. It just jumped up. Look, look, it just jumped up for you. Say goodbye and buy Occidental for about the same price. CVX, which... For as corrupt as uh, Exxon's been over the years, Chevron's a more corrupt company. Um, they just jumped up for you. Sell them. Switch into Accidental, Pioneer, and Kana. Right? You know, I, I don't know if I can say it any more plainly than that. What percentages? You know, that's, 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 that's a tougher call, right? I, I'm heavy in Encana and Occidental with some um, Helmerich Payne and Pioneer. I, I'm, I'm in love with Occidental and Encana, you know, so the other ones are just so that I don't, you know, just so I have a bullpen. You know how dating works, right? All right. For the recent explorations, Guyana, do you, yeah. Right. So somebody's talking about uh, Guyana, um, uh, Exxon's um, development there. And he says that the project breaks even at $35 a barrel. No, <laughs> it breaks even at $35 a barrel after they've produced enough. So take a look at that. It doesn't just break even. At, if they, they put a $10 billion into that project and they get $35 on the first barrel, are they even? No. They gotta make $10 billion back. So the idea that all of that is gonna get developed is wrong. It won't. Second, it doesn't actually break even at $35 a barrel. It breaks even at $35 a barrel over a long period of time. Does that, does that resonate with everybody? 
If you spend a million dollars on a property today, right, that you're going to redevelop because you think that it's going to be a $3 million property in five or 10 years. Did you make your money back the day you bought it? No. Now you have to think about, well, do I want the risk of 10 years? There could be a recession. Property might not develop well. Maybe the suburb never makes it there. Maybe that part of town gets worse, right? Long cycle, deep water development is shit. Say it with me. Long cycle, deep water development is shit. Stick with the land plays, fast cycle, break evens in the 40 range. There's no point in spending tens of billions of dollars to break even a shade under what shale is breaking even at when it's going to take you 10, 10 years to make your money back. All right. I just want to make that very, very clear. All right. Uh, so we're going to go, we're going to stop recording right here. I, I thank you on the oil side. I'm going to keep going with the meeting because there's other questions, but this is an oil uh, recording. So we are going to stick with oil here. Um, if, if you want to uh, know more, there's a special on becoming a member to Margin of Safety Investing over at um, Seeking Alpha, $365 a year for the rest of your life. Um, future uh, discounts for margin of safety investing will only be for, for the first year. Over at Fundamental Trends, which is three ninety nine a year regularly, uh, if you use the um, code two hundred, like the number two zero zero off O F F two hundred off, you get the first year for one ninety nine, and then subsequent years for uh, three ninety nine. So. I think the fundamental trends and, and margin of safety are extremely uh, similar. I intend that to be the case. I am redesigning fundamental trends and I'm going to add other analysts to that site. So in the very long term, I'd say spend a couple extra dollars on uh, fundamental trends. But um, if, if you're really tied to the Seeking Alpha platform, it's a great platform. Um, use margin of safety investing and, and do it before the end of May. All right, I will uh, talk to you again in about 10 seconds. And uh, if you want more oil articles, I've got another one coming out uh, Saturday morning, which will basically be a summary of everything we talked about today. Have a great weekend. All right.